All right, let's move on. Uh, we've talked a lot uh, over the years about teen pregnancy and what is the best way to handle this. Uh, here's something I I don't think I've heard of this before. Indiana could become the first U.S. state to allow the use of the baby boxes an, uh, as a uh, broad-scale uh, effort to prevent dangerous abandonments of infants. Uh, it could be the first state to use this uh, to prevent this sort of thing uh, from happening. Uh, the congressman says this: uh, his bill is a natural progression of laws that give parents a legal way to surrender newborns at hospitals, police stations, and other facilities without fear of prosecution so long as the child has not been harmed. To talk more about all of this, Gary Derenfeld is with us, a social worker, yoursocialworker.com, to find out more. And he's here now. Good afternoon, Gary. How are you today? I am so happy to be back with you, Scott. Great to have you here. What are your thoughts on something like this? And I guess my first question is, uh, is this that much of a problem? Huh. Well, um, you know, across North America, there are thousands of babies that are abandoned uh, by moms, typically, who, for whatever reason, are not in a place or a desire to, to provide the care for their children. So the issue becomes, how do they relinquish their child? And this is not a new issue. If we go back to the, to the 1800s, there were these things called foundling wheels, and it would be like at the abbey or, or the, the, uh, the, the religious, what are these things called, uh, the convent, right. where, where um, a mother could safely bring their child, put them into this thing that kind of looked like a rotating wheel, safely, uh, turn the wheel around, the child is now on the inside of, of the facility, hmm. she can ring the bell and trot off. So, so we're looking at what are the strategies available for helping somebody who is likely frightened manage the relinquishing of their child. Are we avoiding teaching responsibility by allowing this? Well, you know, um, not necessarily. Maybe that's the most responsible thing that that um, parent, typically a mom, could do. Mm. What we need to do as a society is ask ourselves what other structures are in place to to facilitate a parent's care for their child or to provide alternates to to this kind of clandestine um, relinquishing. And so, you know, that's we've been talking. We've had the sex ed debate here in the province of Ontario. Um, maybe if we teach um, children at younger ages. How to how to not get pregnant? Maybe that will yeah. you know be part of the solution. If we um, change some of the laws in 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 Canada that would allow a parent to to more easily relinquish a child at hospital, no questions asked. Maybe that would make it easier. So so we have to look at a whole bunch of social structures to deal with or to support moms who, for whatever reason, can't care for their child. Yeah, what would be the difference in having this discussion within the walls of the hospital as opposed to waiting till someone gets out the door and then dumps the baby off in a box? Well, you know, let's, let's not put a dump the baby off. No, in no, a it's box. not when like... talk about these baby boxes, they would be safe constructed items yeah. attached to a facility such that a parent can come in, uh, open the outside of the, this box. The child is placed in a safe, comfortable environment. Placing the child in would trigger an alarm that the person inside could come retrieve the child and take care of the child. I didn't mean to make it appear like it was a book depository or a library or anything <laughs> yeah. like that, or, yeah. you know, the old video drop-off or anything. Right, but, 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 but our listeners really have to understand that context. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, I lost sight of the question with that. Uh, I guess my point in all of this, it reminds me, do we, pe do we give people fish or do we teach them how to fish? At the end of the day, uh, shouldn't we be teaching them how to parent, the, uh, how to parent them, well, well, taking that, the problem away? Yes, that would be wonderful. And, and Scott, your question had to do with why can't uh, parents just rel relinquish their children at hospital? I'm glad you remember the question. <laughs> uh, so, so let me speak to that. Um, some parents, some moms, uh, they, their own families may not know about the pregnancy. They may worry about how that pregnancy and birth will be met within their own family. Some are worried about uh, an abusive uh, a 
other parent. And so they may, uh, and if you do this at the hospital, there will be some or there may be some pressure upon that mother to, to report the name of the father, uh, to give their own name, to give identifying information that can come back in some way or other to haunt that mother in a way that that, that mother fears. Um, you know, the downside to all of this is, uh, from a father perspective, typically there, you know, the, there's a father. Um, you know, what about his rights? Uh, does the father not have an opportunity to care for the child? Does the father even know about the, the pregnancy? From the child's perspective, um, you know, we have charters of children's rights through the United Nations. Uh, I think it's the United Nations, in, in, any way, in, in any case, where children have a right to basic information about themselves. And so in this process, children won't have that basic information, hmm. you know, even if it's biological information about themselves. But uh, at, at, at the end of the day, Scott, we are weighing, will this mother literally leave this child in a, in a dumpster versus... Uh, provide for a safe um, uh, letting go. Uh, worried if, uh, you know, and again, I can see this being, you know, designed obviously for the most extreme case, like the one you just mentioned of yep. being in a dumpster. Uh, are we worried, though, that in trying to facilitate people who find themselves in that predicament, that it will also be an easy way out for those who just don't want to do it anymore? So there you go. There are going to be plus minuses to every solution. And, and the larger question is, what are we as a society doing to support um, parents and particularly um, those parents who, who are experiencing perhaps an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy where they, where they fear detection, they, they, they fear recrimination, the result of, of the pregnancy and the delivery. How do we support these persons? I could see that if you implemented something like this, you would see an increase in abandoned babies. No? You know what? I don't know that we necessarily have the data to support that. No, it's just an assumption. Right. And so we do know that um, across the U.S., some of the websites report, and you know, I can't vouch for their research, but they report there is in the neighborhood of some 1,600 um, child abandonments where, where the child is literally left in a dumpster and, you know, it typically results in the, the death of the child mm. versus some 22 or 2,500 um, relinquishments through these other means which are safe for the child. So, you know, that, that might give us an overall number in the U.S. of under 5,000. So in Canada, you know, if we take the 10% rule, we're, right. we're not looking at large numbers per se, but whether or not we're looking at large numbers, we're looking at life. Mm. And so how are we going to support life in these of, of some of the most, most challenging situations? Uh, let's switch gears. I didn't, uh, I, we didn't tell you we were going to bring this up, so I'm, I'm sort of blindsiding you, but I'm sure you've heard the story, or maybe haven't, about uh, sex in the library. I haven't heard this one. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it was on the news a couple of days ago, uh, Windsor Library uh, upset because uh, a girl has been going in there, a young teenage girl has been going in there, and uh, uh, taping herself, video, uh, recording herself, um, doing things she shouldn't be doing, showing parts of her body, masturbating, uh, that sort of thing. And it's within the confines of the quiet spaces of a library. And uh, this seems to be a new trend where people are going into places where they shouldn't be or where this sort of activity isn't accepted. And doing this, well, you can actually see patrons in the background walking back and forth, just uh, oblivious to what this girl is doing. Apparently, it's a trend, and you can see there's sites or, or, or people who dedicate themselves to doing this sort of thing. I guess it's all part of the whole, 
you know, pay for the podcast thing. And uh, and, and that's the latest, is a, a girl who's been uh, not caught, but certainly they've seen the videos and trying to find out who she is who's doing this in two Windsor libraries. Well, you know, the first thing that goes through my mind is how sad uh, that that occurs. Um, people, some, you know, particularly adolescents, they don't realize how they are being exploited even when they choose to voluntarily participate in these kinds of activities. So, so we don't want to beat these people up, but we certainly do want to, as best we can, intervene and help them deal with whatever issues are going on in their life such that this may seem like a desirable alternative. Um, so it's sad, Scott. It, 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 it's, it's kind of shocking. It's kind of sad. And, and the flip side to this is, damn it, there's always an audience for this, uh, for yeah, this garbage. Yeah. Well, you know, what? I think a lot of this, and I don't know, but from what I've read in, in over the last 24 hours, that this, you know, it's about the thrill. It's about it's about the shock. It's about exactly what you just said. It's it's about doing something in a place where you're not supposed to be doing it, and the thrill of of not getting caught. Yep. Yeah, so all but, how, of this, but how do you balance the thrill? Because all all adolescents will do something like this, whether it's uh, playing sports, whether it's you know they'll you they'll exercise it in different ways. Uh, how do you how do you get that cheap thrill as a kid without you know uh, as you said exploiting the rest of your life? Because this will be around to haunt you forever. Yes, so that's part of the adolescent brain. It really hasn't matured uh, enough to appreciate the impact of of the decisions made. I'm going to come back to the Ontario sex ed curriculum because within the curriculum, teachers are going to be talking about now sexting and, and, and the sexual exploitation um, that can occur uh, through the Internet. And, and that's, that's really the antidote to this. We have to get ahead of these issues with our kids such that we can teach them what's appropriate, inappropriate, the consequences of this behavior, how this stuff lives way on past our own uh, adolescence. And, 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 you know, this is why I support the sex ed, uh, the new sex ed curriculum. Yeah, me too. Because these things are happening. We can't, as parents, we can't keep up with the nonsense that a kid can get into. Mm-hmm. So we have to talk about these things at younger and younger ages. Statistically, when we talk to children, you know, just ahead of them reaching uh, the age where they may participate in these activities, we actually lower the likelihood that they will participate in these activities. That's why we talk to them a little younger than what you may anticipate. And, you know, every uh, kids are kids. They do it different ways, I guess. Uh, but the sad part is about the reality of today with technology is uh, as a juvenile delinquent, it's recorded for the rest of the world to see forever. Yep. Uh, whereas in the old days, it's done, it's dealt with, it's moved on. Now, uh, and I think that's what makes it so difficult for parents and possibly teachers, is that, you know, this isn't one of those things that can be thrown off uh, like water off a duck's back. It will, it, it has, there's ramifications. It comes back to haunt you. So uh, maybe you and I remember, because we're a little older, back in the, I don't know, 70s and 80s, the trend for Streaking, yeah, and mooning, yes, mooning. <laughs> oh my, yes. <laughs> there was just something great about driving out of the high school parking lot in the back of a pickup truck with your rear end hanging out. Very. I don't know what it was, but I love doing it. <laughs> there you go. So we could get caught and spend some more time in detention. Is that the? Is that what we're looking for? I don't know. We never even thought that far in advance. That's right. That's right. So that was our adolescent brain back then, you know, and, and at, at every uh, stage, you know, there's a new crop of adolescents and a new way of being stupid. But, you know, you know Gary, that's sad because yeah. at least we were allowed to do some stupid things. Now it seems the stupidity, the level of uh, intensity has risen. I, I don't know that we were allowed to do those kinds of stupid things either. It's not something our parents would say, hey, isn't that great? You did some mooning today. Yeah. <laughs> what a productive way for an afternoon to be spent. Yeah, 
you know, the, the issue, you know, 2015 is, you know, as we've been saying, this stuff outlives the moment. Yeah. So now we've got pictures of people mooning. Huh. And, it, and it's worse than that. So how, does, how do you, ba- well, I guess the way you balance it is just like you said with education, getting back full circle to the sex ed curriculum. Yeah, and i got to tell you, these aren't all what you would think of as bad kids. No. No, these can be normal. Look, look we turned out all right, and we were doing it. <laughs> Reasonable kids who get caught up in a fad in a moment of stupidity. But again, that's why we have to have the discussion in advance. And we're not, unfortunately, ever able to protect all of our children from their own um, behavior. Uh, are you worried? Like, so what happens with things like this library thing is that once one starts it, then it's it's it becomes like a trend. Everybody wants to do it. It's like um, you know, it's uh, it's like dumping buckets of water over your head. Yeah, yeah. You know, as a trend, I think it'll only go so far. Uh, I think eventually somebody will be detected. We'll hear all the news about that. There'll be tremendous fallout. There'll be more security at your. There'll be more security at your local public library. That's yeah, for sure. There, there will be that too. Will it do more to bring boys into the library, though? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have even said that. That's just irresponsible of me, isn't it? Oh my gosh! But you know what? Sometimes we have to laugh at these things, regardless of how actually serious they are. They are serious. But but it, you know we don't. But here's the interesting thing, and I wrote a I wrote a blog about this last week sometime, Gary, and and I'm sure we've talked about it before. And again, I don't mean to sound like an old fart here, but when people used to put film in cameras and then take a picture, nobody ever took naked pictures of themselves in fear of the people that developed them would report you. Or and what would you do? Put them in an envelope and mail them to somebody. Right. But now we because we can have them in our hand, because we can take a picture and view it immediately and delete it if we want and even Photoshop it if we want. All of a sudden we feel the need to take shots of ourselves naked. Right. Well, there were those instamatic cameras. Yeah, there's the Polaroids. And, yeah, the Polaroids, thank you, that did spawn a whole bunch of private porn. Yeah. And then uh, amongst ne'er-do-wells, they would be used almost as trading cards. And that would also have entered into the child porn industry. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's just uh, the terrible dark side uh, to all these behaviors and opportunities. And all technology is doing it is bringing it to the surface so we can all see how bad we are. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to come back to I support the Ontario Sex Ed curriculum. We have to have these discussions with our children. Something like uh, you and I today talking about this openly uh, on the radio is going to spur some of those discussions tonight at the dinner table. When your child, uh, who never was much of a library person, is now telling you, Mom or Dad, <laughs> hey, I'm off to the library, you may want to wonder why and say, hey, I was thinking of looking at some books, too. Then if they say they no longer want to go, then your suspicion can, you know, up the ante on your su- suspicion. It's not like you're saying, hey, I want to visit, uh, go with you on your date. There should be no Yeah, good why. point. Why, why a parent can't uh, follow you or, or attend with you to the library. Gary Dierenfeld has been with us, social worker, yoursocialworker.com to find out more. Gary, thanks for the time as always. Stay safe, my friend. You too. It is 127, 900 CHML. I'm Scott Thompson, Canada's worst driver. Come into the hand.